Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started today. Thank you all for joining us. I saw some familiar names in the chat, which is always really exciting. Um, so if you will, Tia, next slide. So my name is Lee Taylor Penn. I'm a senior policy analyst at Families USA. And today we have two guest speakers. Um, we have Tara um, Mancini and we have Lexi White. And they're with Power to the Side and In Your Own Voice, um, National Black Women's Reproductive Health Agenda. So if you are on Twitter, feel free to give all of us, all of our organizations a follow. Um, next slide. So um, a quick agenda for the next um, hour. Um, this is the welcome, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna do an overview of our contraceptive care paper that recently was release, released. Um, and then Lexi is going to speak and then Tara will speak. We'll have Q and A and then closing remarks. Next slide. So first, I just want to talk about um, the Center on Health Equity Action for System Transformation. So that is the center that is hosting this webinar today. Um, that's part of Families USA. So the center is the only national entity exclusively dedicated to the, the development and advancement of patient-centered health system transformation policies designed to reduce racial, ethnic, and geographic inequities. We focus on advancing equity while improving outcomes, increasing value, and lowering cost. We do this by catalyzing and coordinating action to develop and implement health equity-focused healthcare delivery and payment policies. And we achieve impact by partnering with and supporting community leaders, health equity experts, and other stakeholders at national, state, and local levels. Next slide. So as many of you know, delivery system and payment transformation relies on evidence-based care as a way to achieve higher quality and more affordable care that results in better health outcomes. But in many cases, the evidence base is incomplete and biased. So at Families, we want to identify and promote representative and transparent evidence to help promote, um, to help promote um, health equity for decision makers. Um, so this is the focus of our evidence for equity initiative. So as part of this initiative, we have partnered with the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute to translate the results of PCORI funded studies into actionable and clear policy recommendations for state and national advocates and policymakers. Next slide. So just a little bit about PCORI, if you're not familiar with them, um, they were authorized by Congress in 2010. Um, they have a mandate to improve the quality and relevance of evidence available to help patients, caregivers, clinicians, employers, insurers, and policymakers make better informed health decisions. And we will put um, a link in the chat to the PCORI website if you're interested in visiting that later. Um, and then they have three goals, which is to increase the um, quantity, quality, and timeliness of uh, information to support health decisions, speed up the implementation and use of PCORI evidence, and then influence clinical and healthcare research to make sure that it's more patient-centered. Next slide. So over the past three years, through our partnership with Corey, we've released a series of reports um, that focus on addressing disparities and improving health equity um, that utilize patient-centered um, outcomes research. And so in our latest report, we are talking about contraceptive care. Next slide. Important evidence from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute offers critical insights into how best to tackle inequities in reproductive care. PCORI research suggests that patient-centered contraceptive care promotes equity and improved patient outcomes, especially for people with low incomes, people with disabilities, and people of color who have experienced historic and ongoing harm stemming from programs of forced or incentivized sterilization along with commonplace biases in contraceptive care. 
So the growing evidence base from Corey demonstrates a need for access to all methods of contraception, removing barriers to care, and implementing patient-centered contraceptive counseling and prioritizing patient autonomy rather than a one-size-fits-all approach that steers patients to a most effective method of contraception with most effective, in quotes. In this report, we seek to elevate these research findings to help inform state decision makers who seek to create effective ways to improve contraceptive access decrease rates of unintended pregnancies, better address personal contraceptive need, and improve overall health outcomes. So the recommendations um, that we have in our paper, they center on three things. Increasing affordability of contraceptive methods, reducing provider barriers, and improving patient-centeredness of contraceptive care. In each area, we highlight possible solutions that decision makers at the state level might consider that would result in improvements in patient outcomes and health equity. Our guest speakers today, um, Lexi White and Tara Mancini, are going to expand on the concepts of contraceptive equity and contraceptive need and talk about promising pol policy solutions at the state level to improve health equity and improve health outcomes as it relates to contraceptive care. So um, next slide. So let's see, um, I'm gonna do a quick bio for you. And of course I lost the bio. This is what happens, you know, working from home and trying to manage multiple screens. Um, so um, first of all, I just wanna say, we really, families really seize in your own voice and power to the size, to the side is really two powerhouses um, that are focusing on how to improve contraceptive equity um, across the US. And we're really grateful to have them here today. So um, Lexi White is the Director of State Policy and Advocacy at In Our Own Voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda. Lexi is passionate about building intersectional movements and driving policy change and political representation that centers the full health and well-being of Black women, women of color, and LGBTQ people of color. Lexi's policy advocacy and movement building work has also included working with New Voices for Reproductive Justice, the Philadelphia Commission for Women as a mayoral appointee, Babashi Transition to Hope, Grassroots Campaigns Philadelphia, and the Penn Women's Center. Lexi holds degrees from Temple University and the University of Pennsylvania. So Lexi, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Lee, for the introduction. I always get a little bashful when people read bios, so thank you for, for the great intro. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here for today's conversation. Um, I'm not going to be presenting a slide deck today, but I am going to talk um, about the Black Reproductive Justice Policy Agenda um, and how Black women-led uh, organizations and leaders have come together to paint um, a comprehensive vision at the federal level to protect contraceptive equity um, uh, as a part of a vision to, uh, to champion state level protections um, for contraceptive healthcare um, and fam family planning services. Um, In Our Own Voice is a national and state partnership of eight Black women-led reproductive justice advocacy organizations across the country um, whose work centers the voices and full lived experiences of Black women, femmes and girls, um, and gender expansive people in this ongoing uh, policy fight to secure reproductive justice for all. Reproductive justice um, for our purposes and, and the purposes of our conversation, I just want to make sure I define this for everyone, uh, includes a fundamental right to access high quality health care um, and a full range of reproductive health care. It is our fundamental right uh, rooted in a human rights framework to have full agency in decision making about our bodies, um, our gender and sexuality, our work and labor, um, and our reproduction. Um, that includes our right to have children, to not have children, and to raise and rear families 
um, in communities that are free from violence and oppression. So we are certainly centering intersectionality and a human rights framework as we think about um, accessing uh, the fundamental reproductive health care that we need and that, and that our communities and, and families need. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the Black RJ policy agenda. Um, so in June of this past year, um, in our own voice, National Black Women's uh, Reproductive Justice Agenda, um, Interfaith Voices for Reproductive Justice and Sister Love Inc. Um, released the Black RJ Policy Agenda, which is an innovative and proactive policy document created in collaboration with more than 30 Black women's organizations um, and reproductive justice advocates, other issue experts um, across the country, um, you know, who came together to the Black, to the backdrop of a, of a global pandemic, to the backdrop of, of heightened state, state violence in our communities and unprecedented attacks on some of our most basic reproductive rights um, to really paint a proactive policy vision um, to address issues at the intersections of race, gender, class, sexual orientation, and gender identity, um, and the impacts, um, you know, considering our, our reproductive health care um, in the context of our economic situations, our political realities. Um, uh, that, that define our experiences and impact our experiences uniquely as Black women and, ba and Black LGBTQ people. Um, and certainly, um, ACT is among many priorities when it comes to uh, uh, paving a way for comprehensive reproductive health. Um, it's it's interesting because um, you know from the nation's founding, uh, control and exploitation of Black women's bodies has played a really critical role um, in in maintaining um, you know everything from slavery institution the institution of slavery um, through forced child rearing, um, as well as efforts to control and exploit our bodies through the eugenics movement. Um, through histories of forced sterilization uh, policies and practices that, that really have targeted marginalized groups, um, including women of color, low-income women, immigrant women, folks living with disabilities and folks who are incarcerated. Um, the ability of Black women and marginalized communities to have full self-determination um, in all areas of our, of our lives is, is fundamentally impacted by this history of reproductive oppression um, and reproductive coercion. Um, and we know that these issues of self-determination that we talk about are particularly relevant with respect to contraception and family planning. Um, access to contraception has enormous benefits for women um, worldwide and, and can have enormous benefits um, for, for Black women who are seeking care um, you know, everything from reducing the number of unintended pregnancies and high-risk pregnancies. Um, uh, it has also been proven to, to be an effective, um, or it can be an effective option, um, a number of forms of contraception to address things like ovarian cysts, um, uh, endometriosis. Um, I would even say in my experience as someone who is not non-binary and a bit more masculine of center on the gender spectrum, um, even navigating gender affirming care um, and, and pain management um, that really impacts uh, my, my overall health and well-being. Um, and for me that experience has been difficult navigating health systems. Um, despite the, the need for this fundamental care, um, Black women uniquely continue to face um, a lot of provider bias um, about recommended family planning services, um, a lot of coercion around contraceptive choices and services, all in addition to disproportionately living in contraceptive deserts where um, uh, it's hard to not only get somewhere where we can access this care, um, but where this care is, is not covered. Um, Again, bias, discrimination, stigma are all uh, unfortunately factors that those who seek contraceptive care um, and, and, you know, including and beyond, sorry, reproductive health care, including and beyond contraception um, are navigating. 
Um, there's a lot of um, data that talks about how women of color have been, um, you know, subtly or not so subtly encouraged to choose certain modes of contraception, um, such as long acting reversal, reversible contraception and LARCs, um, and have faced challenges, um, you know, have, have also disproportionately faced challenges when they've wanted to, to have um, an IUD, for example, removed um, in a timely manner when they've needed it, um, as just an example. And, and I don't want to talk about that um, in the context of, you know, us uh, privileging any one form of contraception over the other. We certainly are in, in the advocacy uh, world uh, recommending that folks make the best decisions for themselves and their bodies and have access to a full range of information on different types of contraceptive methods. Um, but we know that, um, you know, that there is a history of, of coercion that has characterized our experiences and our counseling around this care, um, as well as, you know, what which uh, modes, methods we can, we can afford. Um, additionally, um, just to give a, a bit, and I know Tara will talk more around landscape, but you know, it should be noted that many women who lack economic uh, uh, stability, uh, therefore rely on, on public insurance, um, have trouble accessing care. Um, approximately 21 million people rely on public funded family planning services. Um, 3.7 million of, of those women are black women. Um, one in four black women and approximately 52% of black girls under the age of 17 use Medicaid co to cover their healthcare costs. Um, I wanna talk about some of our policy recommendations um, to address the multifaceted problem that is um, both barriers to accessing contraceptive care um, for black communities um, and individuals who seek counseling to, to plan their families and their contraception. Um, and, and fundamentally, I think first and foremost is, you know, we, we want to codify Title X family planning regulations. Um, we need Congress to ensure that the federal government sets a clear standard and mandate that all people, regardless of their insurance coverage, their employment status, or their immigration status, um, can access comprehensive family planning counseling and services. Um, and you know, I, I look to California as in the, in the state as a model um, with the with California's Family Pact program um, that that is a good model for covering contraception and reproductive health care, regardless of an immigration of an individual's immigration status, um, their race, religion, um, location, or other factors um, based on. Um, you know, assuming that they, they meet the financial eligibility requirements and also, you know, do not have access to coverage for those services um, through, through other uh, medical coverage. Um, we want to, Black women who came together for this agenda want to see prescription contraceptives at no cost. Um, you know, we want to see legislation that ensures that all family planning methods are equally affordable. Um, to increase the likelihood that we can get access to contraceptives, that we can use them effectively, um, and that we can get the full care that we need around contraceptives, around contraceptive services. Um, we certainly want to expand Medicaid's reimbursement for counseling about contraceptives. Um, Medicaid regs do not currently require providers to offer and pay for counseling about contraceptives. Um, because Medicaid is jointly funded um, by states in partnership with federal government, there are a lot of decisions about coverage. As I know folks on this call on this webinar know that, um, you know, are left up to state governments. Um, and this is where a lot of bias can really seep in. Um, uh, you know, requiring coverage of complete contraceptive counseling, regardless, again, of, of it. Um, or, or immigration status um, is key, um, including the time spent discussing contraceptive options. Um, we would also want to see programs that combat anti-Black racism and expand diversity and cultural competency training for healthcare professionals who are prescribing um, contraceptive, who are providing contraceptive care, prescri prescribing contra contraception and 
um, providing counseling around contraceptive services and, and other family planning services. Um, and you know, this is to ensure that all individuals, again, receive culturally competent, timely, respectful, um, relevant, uh, you know, care that's relevant to their, their cultural identities and experiences. Um, and we'd like to see this training be mandatory um, through medical schools, uh, medical school board exams um, and continued medical education credits. Um, really bring a pa patient-centered approach and a trauma-informed approach, including critical race theory, which we're hearing so much about in the news right now, um, but to address implicit bias. Um, I don't even love that term implicit bias. I, I would prefer we, we just call it what it is, anti-Black racism. Um, we want to fund federally qualified health centers. Um, we want to make sure Planned Parenthood and other Title X providers are able to provide um, comprehensive uh, counseling, uh, screening, STI, and HIV testing. Um, and we want to also, you know, expand access to contra contraception in contraceptive deserts um, through pharmacies. Um, Senator Cory Booker and Rep. Carolyn Maloney have had a bill um, to establish, you know, duties for pharmacies to ensure that um, the FDA, that uh, provisions of FDA approved contraception um, is available in, in, in places where we see contraceptive de deserts. And so that is a bill that, that we're endorsing at the federal level um, and looking to as a model for combating uh, barriers at the state level. I will add that, um, you know, this is something that, that our communities support. And we have a lot of policy, uh, sorry, a lot of polling information that, that reminds us, you know, every year um, that um, Black women overwhelmingly support um, access to contraception. Um, they also believe that, you know, we have the, the power to, to influence elections and, and influence decision makers who are, make, who are um, again, there are more than 19 million women living in the U.S. Um, and living in contraceptive deserts. Um, and we know that, you know, uh, eight in 10 um, women of color voters, so this is black women, um, Latinx women and AAPI women voters um, see societal and person, personal benefits to women having control over their reproductive decisions. Um, earlier in the year, we weighed in on um, the uh, US Department of Health and Human Services notice of proposed rulemaking to ensure access to equitable, affordable, client-centered um, quality family planning services. Um, uh, and I have been advocate, had helped to advocate for a full restoration to the Title X program to its original intention of serving communities that need care most who are living with low incomes um, and in doing so also protect access to things like gynecological exams, um, pap tests, breast exams, um, prevention for HIV AIDS and other STIs. Um, and we also would like to see the Title X program uh, improved, you know, prioritizing funding going to Title X sites that were pushed out by the gag rule under the Trump administration. Um, again, expanding the scope of services beyond physicians alone um, to not only include, you know, nurse practitioners and physician assistants, but to also clearly include nurse midwives, health educators, and other certified doulas um, who uh, are equipped to provide culturally affirming trauma-informed care, um, support, and services. Uh, we also want, just to give a few examples, I won't go through all of these, but to, to include the use of gender-affirming ter uh, terminology and gender-affirming care as a part of the scope of reproductive care, um, contraceptive counseling, and family planning counseling. Um, you know, related to our sexual and reproductive health. Again, I can't emphasize this enough in my own experience, um, even just, you know, trying to, to access birth control for, for management. Um, there's so many assumptions made 
um, around uh, pregnancy prevention and um, th that I've experienced with providers. And so I would just say we need um, more gender inclusive. We need providers um, who are really deeply committed to thinking about contraception also through a lens of, of gender affirming care for folks who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and for folks who also may have experiences with, um, with violence and, and, and sexual trauma. Um, we want to overtly name addressing structural racism, anti and gender for, and gender discrimination as a part of the directives for advancing um, health equity in um, Title X clinic. Um, and, and to see uh, Black racism in their facilities. Um, and so I will just do a time check. Lee, how am I doing on time? Two more minutes. So we'll have time for uh, Tara and then Q&A. OK, great. Um, a few more of our, our recommendations um, here um, include expanding availability of, of telehealth. Um, you know, beyond the more limited term telemedicine, but including counseling around obtaining prescriptions, um, around other reproductive health care services, in, including abortion and self-managed abortion um, as a part of a full range of, of options counseling. Um, you know, and I would add that, you know, in this particular moment, as we are seeing, um, you know, conservative courts and, and continuing to see state lawmakers making it their business to push uh, reproductive health care out of reach by any means. Um, it, is, it is critical that, that we tell the full story of the needs of, of contraceptive care in our communities um, and that we protect access for the communities who are most vulnerable, um, communities who are struggling um, to make end, ends meet. Um, and to uh, black and brown women and, and queer and trans folks who are already um, disproportionately impacted by barriers to healthcare more broadly, um, you know, compounded with, with barriers to reproductive healthcare. So I will wrap up my there um, and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Lexi. If you have any them in either of the green, um, let's see, thank you so much for your remarks. Um, so many things to think about there. Um, so next we're gonna have um, Tara Mancini from Power to the Side. Um, she is the Director of Public Policy at Power to the Side and helps advance Power to the Side's policy priorities through her advocacy work, both with grassroots and policymakers. In 2017, she helped launch Power to the Side State Policy Project, which focuses on policies that improve information about and access to contraception. Um, her additional experience includes time with New Deal leaders and the Georgetown University Center for Children and Families. Tara earned a, um, a degree from Rhode Island College and from American University. A Washington DC resident, Tara looks forward to once again visiting the local pandas and attending stand-up comedy shows. Me too, Tara. Um, okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Tara and Tia, if you'll pull up the slides again. Thank you, Lee. Uh, thanks for having me today. Happy to be here uh, with you all, with the panel. Again, I'm Tara Mancini with Power to Decide, and I am going to, oh, sorry, next slide. Uh, for those who don't know Power to Decide, I believe Lee dropped the link in the chat, but we're a national nonprofit organization in Washington, DC, and we work to ensure that every young person has the power to, to decide if, when, and under what circumstances to get pregnant and have a child. Next slide, please. So today I will briefly cover some of the state level contraceptive coverage policies that are highlighted in the Families USA paper that have gained traction in a good swath of states. 
Um, but before that, I want to provide some context of the federal landscape, which states are operating within. Um, and Lexi uh, talked about some of these things already, so I won't spend too much on the time, too much time on some of those things. But at the federal level, there's three major programs or, or policies that provide coverage or access to contraception. Of course, there is Medicaid, the federal state partnership, uh, which you're all very familiar with. Uh, Medicaid accounts for 75% of public funds that are spent on contraceptive services and four in 10 women of reproductive age with low income uh, are covered by Medicaid. Then we have the Title X Family Planning Program for 50 years. It's played a critical role in providing high quality contraceptive services, uh, preventive screenings, and health education to low income men and women. And it counts for about 25% of public spending on contraceptive services. And along with Medicaid, Title X is a very important part of the health care safety net. Uh, Fortunately, in 2019, as, as Alexi already noted, uh, the Trump administration put in place a gag rule for a lot of clinics out of the network and really sort of undermined the ability of health centers to provide the high quality care um, that they have been known for, for providing for nearly half a century. So the HHS Office of Population Affairs actually uh, estimates that 1.5 million fewer people were actually served by the program due to the gag rule. Fortunately, now the Biden administration has repealed the gag rule and released new funding opportunities that will allow um, you know, those, those grantees that were forced out of the program to come back in. Um, there's also a focus on equity in the new the new um, rule, and this will begin to lay the groundwork for repairing the Title X network. Of course, this is not going to happen overnight. And then, of course, we have the ACE, Affordable Care Act guidelines at implementing the women, Women's Preventive Services provision um, of the Affordable Care Act, which requires all women covered by Medicaid expansion marketplace plans, employer plan, employer-based plans that are not grandfathered to cover at least one contraceptive in each of the FDA approved method categories for women as prescribed without co-pays or deductibles without out-of-pocket out costs. Um, and there has been analysis showing that women saved at least 1.4 billion in out-of-pocket costs in one year on birth control pills. And there's also evidence that it's increasing the ability um, for women to obtain more effective methods of birth control for those who want them, as those to tend to be more expensive. Um, and so on the other hand, we know that we do know that these fits are not reaching everyone. Um, as you heard me just say, you know, it's women's preventive services, these are methods for women, and we know that not just women use or need birth control. So there's, there are, uh, there's opportunity to improve this. Also, it doesn't apply to people in non-grandfathered plans. And the Trump administration passed sweeping exemp exemptions of the ACA requirement, also neglected enforcement of this. And lastly, as there are new methods coming on to the market, we are hearing that some, some people are struggling to get their insurance plan to cover these newer methods. So that was a lot, but that's a, a quick overview uh, of federal landscape. And so I want, oh, next slide, please. And please excuse the typo at the top. I it should say state level policy, contraceptive policies. Um, I'll say a little bit more about each of these policies in a few moments. These are three that we focus on at Power to the Side. None of these alone are civil silver bullet. Of course, um, there's plenty of great suggestions that are in the uh, families paper that was just released, as well as in the Black Reproductive Justice Agenda that Lexi just noted. But these are just three that we focus on at Power to the Side that um, are included in a toolkit and that have gained traction in states. Um, and, and each of all of these 
recommendations are in the Families, families USA paper. Um, next slide, please. So extended supply of contraceptives. Um, states with this policy require insurers to increase the number of months for which they cover a supply of prescription contraceptives at one time. So, you know, typically people only got maybe 30 days to 90 days supply at one time. However, it can be a barrier for a lot of people to have to continually go back to the pharmacy or the clinic to get um, to, to get this just to get the supply just because the insurance is not allowing a larger supply at one time. So um, if if a provider is writing a prescription for 12 months at one time, most states have 12 months at one time that have passed this, but if you have six months at one time, then as long as it's written that way by the provider, then the ins insurer has to cover it at one time and that just removes the barriers or having to you know, get out of work, get out of school, find childcare just to make it to um, pharmacy or a clinic. Um, 23 states, including DC, have passed this legislation. Um, I like to include DC as a state, although I know we're not, but the blue, dark blue states are those that have it. Uh, most recently, Nebraska and Virginia passed legislation on this. Um, Nebraska, I believe, just has six months. Um, Virginia passed it specifically for Medicaid because they already had it for, uh, it already applied in commercial plans. They passed that a few years prior. Um, and the light blue states that you see are states that um, introduced legislation this year, but it didn't pass. And there is a um, link that I think um, Lee or someone can drop into the chat that actually, if you want to um, look at these, uh, in, we have interactive maps uh, uh, similar to what I was showing on the PowerPoint, and you can actually um, click onto your state and find out more information about each of these policies. Um, the next slide, please. So protecting or expanding contraceptive coverage. Um, you know, since 2014, nearly a third of states have undertaken efforts to expand contraceptive access uh, to no, no cost contraceptive access by mandating that health insurance plans cover the full range of it's without cost sharing and limits on utilization controls. Um, some states have been building upon their own sort of progressive record and others um, are building on the ACA requirement that I mentioned a little earlier and and sometimes going beyond that. Of course, also threats to the ACA and, and the coverage provision, as I mentioned in the last few years. So some states were um, acting to try and codify that at the state level. And we've seen states go beyond simply uh, codifying the, the women's um, preventive services or the, the contraceptive coverage mandate at the state level to include, you know, male methods, like I had mentioned earlier, um, to include coverage for, uh, to not require prescription for the coverage, um, to include over-the-counter uh, methods. So um, it's really a mixed bag within the states here, but again, the blue, the darker blue states here are um, those that have passed the policy um, and this past year, eight additional states introduced legislation, um, including California, where a bill passed um, one chamber. They already, as you can see, California's dark blue, it already has a law on the books, but this is um, SB 523 would expand the protections in law to Medicaid, Medi-Cal managed care plans. Um, and I, that bill is still pending, I believe will continue in, um, the new year. It can carry over into the new year. And then finally, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Finally, pharmacists prescribing of contraception. Uh, so allowing states, allowing pharmacists to prescribe contraceptives uh, 
to folks at the pharmacy without having to have you know a physician involved. Um, as you can see, the dark blue, sorry, dark pink states. Um, there's 24, including DC, are states that have a policy that allow this. However, I should note that not all the states have implemented the policies. It often takes time to, um, you know, get a protocol in place, um, get it approved by Board of Pharmacy, Board of Medicine, which is are usually the two um, authorities that have to pass it. Also, with COVID. You know, pharmacists have really been stretched um, to the limit, so things are just really slowed down. But this past year, we had six more states pass laws, and uh, the light pink states again are the ones that introduce, introduce, but did not um, pass it. Uh, although most recently, Wisconsin did pass it through one chamber, and it, it is still pending. Next slide, please. Okay, and so this is just a screenshot of our uh, interactive reproductive health policy maps. As you can see um, at the top of the ribbon, there's the three policies that I just mentioned uh, that I just talked through. And so you can click on any, any of those, click on a state and, and find out more about the bill, um, the law that was passed or click on a link to the bill that was pending. And if you want to see of the of you by your state, you can click on the right um, part of the ribbon where it says all three policies by state and um, click on your state and find out more there. Uh, obviously the state is great. It doesn't have anything going on at the moment, but the great part is we also have, um, if you're on the live page, you can link to our toolkit, which has lots of uh, resources for advocates to learn more about the policies, talking points, data, all of that stuff um, that I invite you to uh, take a look at. And um, that that is all that I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, next slide. Yes, next and slide. that. Okay. And, yes. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Tara. So we're going to open it up for questions um, for Tara. And let's see. Um, so if you'll put your questions in the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen. Um, we do have one question already. Uh, this is from Lisa. Um, Tara, can you say more about what the state laws to protect and contraceptive coverage specifically do? Sure. So they they generally mimic the um, the the contracept the Affordable Care Act's contraceptive coverage requirement. So requiring that um, insurer cover one at least one of the methods in in each method category of FDA approved methods. Um, so that's like proper IUD, hormonal IUDs, um, mini pill, combined uh, oral contraceptive pills, ring, um, within cover those without cost sharing uh, out of pocket. Often it's not every single state is the same. Um, there is a model bill that was created by um, NHELP, uh, National Health Law Project, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, that that includes sort of these extras that I was talking about. So in, in covering um, condo, male condoms, um, vasectomy, also covering um, over-the-counter methods, not requiring a prescription. Um, but the, the point of it is to make sure that there's access to the full range of methods, essentially, so that without the cost, so that everyone um, can have access to the method that is right for them. I mean, Lexi mentioned a lot about um, coercion with methods. Um, we also know that, you know, like I said earlier, there are the IUDs and um, even things like the ring are quite expensive. And so people who might want to try those, if they don't have the coverage for, if they didn't have no cost um, coverage for it, it's a lot of out-of-pocket costs. And um, 
some people, you know, prior to the ACA weren't able to access those methods. So it's really a way of just making sure that everyone who's um, in plans that are covered by those uh, um, state laws, which of course the state laws don't extend to everything, like they don't extend to state funded, I mean, um, self-funded plans, um, but it, it's really a way to make sure that the full range of methods are covered. And I can also drop a link here for the paper, uh, the brief that talks more about those. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Um, I'll also put uh, a link in the chat to the in-health model contraceptive equity um, language, which I think will be helpful. Um, so also wanted to ask, here's a question in, um, in the Q&A that says, um, we have a hostile state legislative environment in Wisconsin, but the support governor and administration. So we're always looking for an opportunity to expand access through administrative, executive, and budgetary means versus just through legislation. So do you have any creative ideas outside of legislative approval? Before I turn over to our speakers, I do want to plug our paper, Sarah, because we do have some things in there that aren't just through legislation. So be sure to check that out. But um, I'll turn it over to Lexi and Tara. Uh, Lexi, I don't know if you want to take it first or. You could go first, Tara. Yeah, I mean, um, does, sorry, I don't know if, if, if Wisconsin, um, sort of like Medicaid requires, um, changes require legislative, um, approval or not. I know every state is different. Um, but, you know, for instance, it's, it might just see like what methods, um, the first thing that comes to mind is like what methods are covered in Medicaid. Um, I know that most states do cover a large, a, a pretty good swath of methods, but I know, and I know that Kaiser Family Foundation usually, um, you know, every few years does a survey and I know that they're our folks from Kaiser on the on the webinar thing like making sure that all the methods are covered in Medicaid um, that would be the first that would be the first thing I would I would think of and suggest but yeah I think there's also a lot of recommendations in the paper that are not necessarily um, legislative Yeah, I, um, let's see, I don't know if you have anything to add here. I was just going to say, I would really start, um, Sarah, by looking at opportunities like Tara was saying with Medicaid and with managed care organizations to see what you can do there. I think there is a lot of possibility, not only in like improving access to contraception, but just making sure that the contraceptive care is patient-centered um, and opportunities um, there as well. And that could even be like connecting with large health systems in your state. Um, I know Lexi was talking about earlier, thinking about gender affirming care, like how are your health systems doing gender affirming care as it relates to contraceptive care? Um, and, you know, maybe thinking about starting there um, and that would be an alternative to legislation. Yeah, and I, I just echoing you, Lee, like I think there's a lot of stuff you can do with the managed care contracts. Um, you know, even even with the extended supply, like you can just see, okay, how how long of a supply of of greed to increase it. Um, so does anyone else? Well, I was just going yeah. to add, like on, like um sort of employer-based administrative advocacy level, and I don't know off the top of my head um, exactly what this looks like in Wisconsin, but I think, um, well, we, we, you know, even in, in Pennsylvania, for example, we, there's still so many places where there are uh, employers who are, you know, choosing plans that, that aren't covering certain things or who are uh, invoking religious 
biases um, on what what methods are covered um, through employer based coverage. Um, so I think um, beyond legislation alone, th there may be opportunity to to mobilize um, and and be in conversation with with specific employers um, that are they're not offering certain plans that they might otherwise be be able to offer. Thank you. We have another great question in the chat. Um, do you have you seen insurance companies get in the way of billing a uh, twelve month um, supplies? Yes. Um, well, I can say, Jesse, that actually in New York, um, yes, you you do have a. a you're in a good, a good blue state, but um, even in those states, there's need for enforcement and making sure that, you know, in com company insurance companies are following the law. Um, because last year, actually, um, Attorney General James sent letters to three insurers in the state saying, uh, based on information that they had from consumers that they weren't following, that they weren't doing that. And that they needed to follow that um, the state law. So, you know, I think as consumer orgs and advocates, um, yes, you need compliance. So I think it is good to, in whatever way you can, you know, solicit from um, consumers, folks you represent, when they're having those challenges. Let you know, collect those stories so that you can bring them to the attorney general or insurance commissioner or whoever is responsible in your state to let them know that this is happening because they have to they have to know whether or not it is happening of course insurance company um there but yeah it, we definitely know with anything in in the insurance world that Insurers will try and get away with what they can get away with, <laughs> honestly. Um, so you, I think you always need to have an enforcement mechanism. They are someone looking into it. Of course, that's money and um, that's, a, that's a whole other pi pile of worms, but the best that you can um, try and, and get feedback from, from folks about whether or not they are, are getting the services or the coverage that they're supposed to, which I know is easier said than done, but. And another thing that I do wanna say is that what you know we've heard in our conversations with other reproductive health groups and policy groups are working on improving access to contraceptive care, that you can pass these really great laws and that it can be poor implementation or poor compliance. So, you know, if you are advocating for these changes, you know, be sure to continue to check in and see how is how is compliance going, how is this implementation going. Um, we have time for one more question. I'm going to call point of privilege to have a question I really want to ask you all. So, but like thinking about all the cases that are going up in the Supreme Court, I mean, ha and and y'all talked, y'all both talked about the need for publicly funded contraceptive care and how important that is. So, how do y'all see these continued attacks on abortion affecting access to publicly funded contraceptive care? So I see a direct correlation. Um, well, in a few, I, I see a direct connection, and and I like to always, you know, call out the actors, right? That again, as I said, it is it is the same lawmakers in the, in many of the same states who are making it their kind of active and ongoing business to push abortion care out of reach. Um, who are you know also taking steps to try to roll back uh, women and communities access to contraception um, and or who are um, uh, looking for ways to, to infuse uh, bias um, and, and who is able to access that care. Um, and so I see as 
as we navigate um, this moment where you know abortion rights are, are really at stake at the highest court in the land, um, I, I see, I, I fear a trend of, of more state, you know, we're seeing more state level attacks um, even under this new administration than we've seen uh, previously in the states on abortion care. I, I fear and, and fully expect that we would, um, you know, continue to see an increase in, in, in rollbacks to state uh, uh, access, coverage, care, and, and clinics that are providing contraceptive counseling and care. Um, I would also add that, you know, one thing I don't think we've talked about yet on this webinar is um, the issue of, of uh, coercive entities or, or, or crisis pregnancy centers in communities um, that are, you know, known for as fake clinics who are providing biased uh, counseling and care often intended to deter um, uh, pregnant people and folks um, from, from seeking abortion care. Um, I certainly uh, worry about uh, these kinds of entities, um, again, not federally qualified health centers, but um, these kinds of entities also being sites where coercive bias information is being relayed around um, contraception. Um, or folks are not getting, you know, obviously the referrals they need around contraception. Um, and so I, I think as, as, as uh, the anti-abortion movement makes more headway in uh, restricting access to, to abortion coverage and care, I, I believe that we will simultaneously see um, uh, more, more attacks on contraceptive care um, in a moment where, frankly, our communities um, uh, might need this care even more. I would 100% um, say yes, or agree with everything that Lexi just said. And, uh, you know, attacks on abortion aren't just attacks on abortion. Like, those folks aren't going to be happy when, if or when they are successful, um, and they have been successful at shipping away at that for years. So it's not going to stop there, even though, you know, outwardly many people, many people who are anti-abortion are saying that they just want to end this practice um, or, you know, stop access to healthcare are not going to stop there. I mean, we've already seen in state, we've seen states that are trying to restrict um, abortion care, like Lexi said, you know, go after contraceptive or certain contraceptives um, even Missouri last year, they tried to do that in, uh, in Medicaid to carve out certain um, methods. And, you know, I think a lot of these states overlap that are, that are, have anti-abortion um, legislation uh, all the time. Also don't have great access to just healthcare generally writ large. I mean, overlay that with states that haven't expanded Medicaid. So it's not it's it's not going to stop at abortion care. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say. Well, so we are already over time. This has been a really rich um, discussion and conversation today. I want to thank all of our participants um, for spending time with us. I want to thank the staff for getting this organized. And most of all, I want to thank our speakers for sharing their expertise um, with us today. Um, keep fighting the good fight and stay in touch. Thanks all so much.